you'll use all these systems if you ever become a social worker. You'll use all of these systems. Uh, we do the same thing in psychology, except we don't admit it. Okay. <laughs> we, we like to pretend we're different. Uh, so we're going to we're going to talk about some of the systems, uh, the, the, the various systems, strength system, uh, resilience uh, system, the uh, family systems. The first one we're going to talk about is family systems, and the reason is because a lot of people have. Um, uh, family structures that, that there is a, there is something negative about their family structures, something negative about the dynamic of their families. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at the family system first. A system is seen as a complex entity within which interactions are as important as the individuals. Uh, in the in the uh, interaction, of course, the family system has to do with uh, all the people in the family and the family dynamics. Not all families are the same. Uh, they're not all whatever we see on television. I'm not sure what we're seeing on television anymore. I haven't watched the television show Blackish, where the father wants the family to be act more black and the mother, who is the mother? I'm trying to think who she actually is. Uh, she comes from a mixed family. As a matter of fact, uh, actually, she came from a mixed family. It's really kind of interesting. So she actually did grow up uh, with uh, both feet in uh, two different uh, two different cultures. Uh, rules are established in the family to teach what is expected or permitted by individual family members. Um, I was living in Mississippi. My next door neighbor, uh, the mother was definitely afraid of dogs, <clears throat> so the kids had to be afraid of dogs. That was the rule. And dad, even though dad lo loved dogs, couldn't interact with dogs because if he did, then the mother would get mad at him. <clears throat> really kind of a strange rules of strange families. Uh, of course, my the neighbors on my other side had uh, packs of dogs. <laughs> and a lot of junk cars laying around. That's where the dogs slept in the junk cars. It was kind of a, an interesting dynamic. So on one side of me, I had people that were definitely afraid of dogs, and on the other side, I had these people that wouldn't control their dogs. Uh, and I was the buffer in between, and uh, I had to uh, try to keep the dogs. I didn't. I. I, I don't mind dogs. Uh, so I tried, had to try to keep the one neighbor's dogs from from crossing over into the yard because this, he was supposed to shoot them, but he would never hit them. She <laughs> The mother was so afraid of dogs. It was so funny. Well, it wasn't that funny because if a dog came into her yard and she was outside, she'd go screaming into the house. And of course, the kids would follow her. And the kids were both male, uh, but they were supposed to scream and run into the house, which seems a little odd. So families, of course, have their own rules. Uh, rules help regulate and stabilize how families function as a unit. Uh, we're looking at this family, this is a Hispanic family, and the father is uh, uh, distributing the juice. The mother cooks the food, the father uh, hands out the drinks, and of course uh, there is the patriarch in the family, and he doesn't have to do anything, and of course uh, he just has to interact with his, with his grandchildren. And that's, that's the rules of that family. Changing one part of the family system will, will result in changes to other parts. Uh, what, we see this a lot uh, if we have an individual that's ADHD, of course. If there's somebody in the family that's ADHD, the entire, all, all of the children in the family have to be treated exactly the same. So if you grow up in a family with one kid that has ADHD, a lot of times what happens is all the children are treated uh, exactly the same. and, and it, and it kind of upsets them because they don't really need to be controlled like the kid with ADHD does. But they have to be controlled because of equality. Does all that make sense? You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you've got a kid with ADHD, you can't just let it go. Like, you know, kids after they're age six, you really don't have to watch them so much. But a kid with ADHD, you have to watch them very, very, uh, very much, almost all the time. Uh, and of course, if you have a child with ADHD, now you have to watch your, your three-year-old and your four-year-old exactly the same, despite the fact they're, they're, they're not suffering from the same thing. And that has to do with the quality, of course. 
If something in the family dynamic changes, like a wife getting a job to help the family finances, the homework uh, distribution will have to change to even out the labor. Uh, father's going to have to start cooking food, uh, potentially when the mother's working. Uh, he's going to have to take care of the children, especially if there's a young child uh, that needs the diaper changed. Uh, he's going to have to start changing diapers instead of handing it off to mom every time that there's a poopy diaper that needs to be changed. I was, when I was in the service, I had a friend that uh, <laughs> refused to change dirty diapers. He could change if, as long as it was just urine, he was okay. But if the if the uh, if the baby uh, had a bowel, he'd throw up. If the guy'd throw up. He couldn't change the diapers. Just the dumbest thing in the whole wide world. But I thought it was the stupidest thing in the whole wide world because I changed. I'd been changing diapers as soon as the baby was born. I was changing poopy diapers. Didn't make any difference to me. Here's the, the kicker, we were working in parasitology. Parasitology is where they give you a stool specimen and you have to look for parasites inside the stool specimen. Now he could deal with, par with, with stool specimens, but he couldn't deal with his own baby's poopy diaper. Well, when the baby was about three months old, the, the wife ran off. She took off with another guy. And so here's this guy with a baby, with a three month old baby, and he can't change a poopy diaper. So what does he do? Family dynamic would change. It's a girlfriend. Uh, it was. Brings you over. <laughs> it looked, I'm sorry? Brings you over. Actually, that's exactly what he did. He'd go <laughs> next door to, to his neighbor, uh, and she would change the poopy diaper. And uh, pretty soon, the, the guy in that house got pissed, or got upset. Uh, got upset, and uh, he told him, you know, you're going to have to figure this out on your own. Because you can't keep coming over two o'clock in the morning and having my wife change the diaper. You know, it was really kind of an interesting situation. He was from Kentucky. He was from the South. He was from the uh, coal mining regions of the South, where men have jobs, and it's very specific as to what they can do and what they can't do. They couldn't. They didn't cook, so he went out every night until he spent all of his money. We weren't making very much money at that point. Really, kind of an odd situation. So sometimes the family dynamic changes, and in his, in his case it really changed a lot. When my first wife left and my son was still uh, breastfeeding, that was, a, that was fairly traumatic. She was already trying to wean him onto a bottle, uh, but uh, he, was, he cried for, for, uh, uh, to be breastfed, and of course <laughs> there was enough body to breastfeed the poor kid. I kind of felt sorry for him. It took him about a week, but he adjusted. and. Uh, Look how screwed up he is today. <laughs> Family systems uh, may open or close uh, be, or be closed in various de to, to various degrees. In closed family systems, the family exists in relative isolation with communication taking place primarily between members. Uh, you, can, it, you probably have never seen this here but uh, on the reservation. But potentially if you watch television, you'll see families that really don't interact with anybody else. Um, in, in a family like this, where it's very, it's a very traditional family, especially if it was part of the aristocracy. What was I? What was I listening? To? Oh, I, I listened to the book uh, "Crazy Rich Asians," which is the book must be this big. I mean, it's huge. Anyway, I listened to that book. A lot of these individuals, uh, these very, very rich families, they can't interact outside because they're afraid that people are after. Uh, so if you've, if you've ever had anything to do with a very, very rich person, uh, they probably don't have a whole lot of friends. They probably don't interact with their own family. I had an aunt with $37 million, and this is back in the 80s, so that $37 million was more like you know, $150 million today. Uh, but she wouldn't have anything to do with practically anybody. She thought everybody wanted her money, which wasn't all really that true, I don't think. Let's see if I can do this. I'm not blinding everyone. There we go. Okay. Anyway, okay. Uh, so she didn't, uh, she, it, she had a fairly closed system, and there were only select people that she would interact with. Well, she made the mistake of interacting with other rich people. And I don't know if you've ever been around rich people, but all they think about is money. So she lost probably a lot more money being around other rich people that told her about this. Uh, this stock and that stock and you need to buy this diamond or that sapphire 
Um, she probably would have been better off with, with her family. She did interact with my family because my dad was a banker. Uh, not that we had any money, but uh, he, un he understood money. Uh, so a family like this, uh, change will be uh, avoided. Members hold on to established traditions and values. And of course, if you watch Downton Abbey when it was on, uh, when, it, when it came out a couple of years ago, uh, that's what we saw in Downton Abbey. A lot of individuals that, that do traditional things, and they, want, they don't want things to change. And of course, uh, this is the conservative movement in the United States. They don't want things to change. They want things to go backwards if they go anywhere. They don't want to see progress. Uh, characteristics of an open family system, uh, willingness to assimilate new information and to engage in ongoing interactions with their environment. Uh, the family has no single correct way of doing things. If you've ever been around a family like this, a traditional family, they, uh, they're, they're a couple of years behind as far as their clothes, their haircut is concerned. Uh, but an open family, of course, they're on the cusp of, uh, of change. They're on the cusp of, uh, of progressiveness. Uh, a traditional family will try to send their ch children to a, a college that will not change them. Um, and a progressive, uh, a progressive family will send their children to colleges that will change them. The family has no uh, single correct way of doing things. Uh, what happened this weekend? Oh, I parked my car. I parked my car. <laughs> I parked my car. I, you wouldn't think that that was such a big deal if you parked your car, but evidently this family, you can't park, you can only park in certain spots. And this spot is for this car, and this spot is for this <coughs> car. And of course, I'd never been there before, so I parked, just parked my car, and I parked my car halfway on one spot and halfway on another spot, so I had to move my car. I had to park it right beside where the, the junker is, the one that they use for parks. Find out, no. <laughs> wow, okay, fine. As the family matures, changes are tolerated, supported, and celebrated. And of course, this is a more progressive <coughs> family. Uh, they, uh, they're more likely to accept change. Uh, in family system perspective, practitioners gain an understanding of how interactions within the family system affect clients. And this is one of the, you have to accept their family dynamic. You have to accept it the way it is. Uh, if there is something toxic about the, uh, the dynamic, then that's what you need to change. But you need to understand what the family dynamic is. As long as the family dynamic uh, isn't causing anybody any, any problems, then you need to leave it the way it is. Uh, because that family has grown up, or that family has evolved uh, using all of these same dynamics. Does that make sense? So the only thing, the only time we want to change something, just because it's not the same as your family, that doesn't mean it's wrong. The only time we need to change something is if uh, the family dynamic isn't working for the family at that juncture. Does that make sense? So we only want to change uh, a problem. We don't want to change something that works. Good job. Okay. Computers dead. Batteries. <laughs> no good. <laughs> Wrong symbol. Family systems uh, assist uh, clients in identifying reciprocal relationships between their behavior and influences of the systems uh, within which they interact. Normally, we, when we see problems, it's because somebody has come from outside to inside the into the family, and that has caused. Uh, has caused problems. Uh, if uh, somebody marries into the family and they can't, they're not getting along, uh, the, the, we, the, we see this a lot. We see uh, in-laws coming in, and the in-laws, of course, are changing the dynamic of the family. Uh, we, I, have, uh, <laughs> I was working with a family one time, and uh, this lady married, there were three brothers, and she married, uh, she married the oldest brother. And, uh, <laughs> Sounds like a movie. She married the oldest brother, and then she realized that she didn't like him as much as she liked the next youngest brother. And I, yeah, the legend of the fall. <laughs> anyway, it was a mess, and it changed the it changed the whole dynamic of the family. Uh, and and they had they they had to come in for counseling. Um, she stayed married to the guy, um, but she was having a third, third second. Is that what happened in Legend of the Fall? 
she started she started having she started having an affair with the second second individual. She ended up with the, with the with the younger. She never married the second guy. She married she divorced the first <coughs> the first brother and married the third brother. So you can imagine you can imagine how much turmoil just one uh, one alien from the outside did on that family. It was really a mess. And of course, I got them when she was still having the, the affair with uh, with the second brother. And the first brother had. Had uh, taken off for Alaska. Taken off for Alaska. He was going to he was going to to, uh, to uh, work on a, one of those ships that goes out and everybody dies or something. It was really bad. Uh, clients realize both that uh, someone else's behaviors influencing them and how their behaviors influencing others. And of course, this is very relatively common, especially if you have someone coming in from outside. Uh, a lot of times we see. Uh, Matriarchs or patriarchs that are controlling families. As soon as the patriarch dies, who's in charge? Uh, this happened in my own family. I had a very, uh, I had a, a father that controlled everybody, and then all of a sudden, uh, he died, and there was nobody in control anymore. My mother didn't want to do it. Uh, my oldest brother didn't want to do it. Uh, I was in Montana, uh, so it was impossible for me to do it. Uh, so what do you do? I mean, what happens with the family? It just kind of fragments. It starts slowly, just dissipates. So everybody, everybody goes their own way. Whereas before we were a, a fairly solid family unit. Ecological perspective views people and their environment as continuously evolving. This is a more progressive idea, uh, other than your family the family perspective. Of course, the only time you'd use a family perspective is would be in family therapy if everybody came in. Uh, sometimes you'll see a situation where uh, the mother is causing problems or the father is causing problems for the individual, and then you, you need to call both of the individuals in so that you can uh, deal with that problem if that person will come in. What if that person won't come in? They don't admit that they're part of the problem. What happens next? So I've got an individual that comes in and they've got a problem. The pro their pro biggest problem is they keep are not interacting very well with a select individual in the family. And so you want that individual in the family to come in so that you can deal with both of them at the same time. But the second person won't come in, so what do you do? We give the second person techniques on how to handle Second person won't accept it. They don't accept that they're part of the policy. Um, oh, how often have we seen that? This is the person with the problem, and you want the second person to come in because they're the ones that are causing the problem for the first person. So what do you do if they don't want to come in? This happened to my, my niece and my, my sister. Counsel the first person? That's all you can do. How to deal with the second person? Yeah, that's all you can do, exactly. Mm -hmm. but you, you, because you can't, you can't force somebody to come in. You can't arrest them. You can't them. speak to them. You can't speak to them. Yeah, you can't, exactly, you can't. Uh, but you have to deal with the situation because that's the only way they're going to, to be able to survive. So they're pretty much going to be guilty until they come and approve themselves at the same time. Well, they, uh, we do, yeah, exactly. Pretty much. Yeah. Because you're going to be counseling just the one exactly. without the second and, input. Yeah. So and they may they're be going to be the bananas. guilty party until they come in and exactly. say otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. So, and there your problems going to keep going. And it'll never, it'll never stop. It'll never stop. It can't stop until either will stop. One or the other one stops. One or the other one dies. Is where it has to happen. <laughs> that's a better one. <laughs> but that's family dynamic. This is ecological perspective. Uh, the ecological perspective is uh, less concerned with cause and effect and more concerned with the transactions that occur between people in their environment. Sometimes it's not a very good fit. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Sometimes you, it's, it's, re, it's a really tough fit as far as the environment is concerned. If you had ever moved, if you've ever moved from one place to another, you know that it, it takes a little time uh, to uh, get used to your, the environment that you're, that you're uh, in at this moment. The ecological perspective was derived from the concept of biological ecology. The structure enables practitioners and clients to think about the reciprocal relationship between people and the environment. One of the things that I have tried, have 
refused to do, despite the fact we were in the military, despite the fact we were getting new orders every two years. Uh, I didn't want to live in the city, which is okay. It's usually okay as far as the Air Force was concerned because they don't usually put Air Force bases in the middle of cities. They normally put Air Force bases out someplace so if they crash their airplanes, they won't kill very many people. <laughs> They're trying to kill as few people as possible. So usually Air Force bases are out someplace. Uh, they're not in cities, but uh, we received a, uh, uh, we were stationed in Washington, D.C. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., there's Washington, and Washington's actually just with, like 67 acres or something of like that. And then you've got uh, Maryland that's relatively built up, and you have California, or California, you have Virginia that's fairly uh, built up. So you, you, in order to get away from the city, you have to go like 30 or 40 miles. And then, of course, it's all horse country out there uh, in Virginia and Maryland. It's all horse country, so you can't get away. Uh, so that, and that was a tough one for me because I do, do not like living around people. This is the most people I've ever actually lived with out in Hogan Housing. I'm a farm boy. I, I want to live out in the middle of that damn soybean field. And it's kind of interesting. The soybeans are turning. <laughs> See, the leaves have to fall off the soybeans, and they have to dry out. That's what has to happen. So as long as they're green, you can't pick them. But as soon as they turn brown, you can think about picking them. But all the leaves have to fall off the uh, soybean plants. Now the problem is that the soybean, <coughs> if all the, the, the plants in the field didn't mature at the same, at the same time, and my neighbor has green, yellow, green, yellow, green, yellow. I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea how he's going to pick that. Anyway, it's a mess. You're worried about it, aren't you? <laughs> so was I. <laughs> uh, the corn hasn't completely turned yet. Okay, so sometimes you don't fit with your environment. Of course, if I had to live in Japan, uh, which I did have to live in Japan for... Uh, a number of months, uh, it was tough. It was really tough because the Japanese, they'll get right up next to you. They don't care. They'll get right up next to you. They'll, they'll bounce up against you. I know. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, ew, don't touch me, don't touch me. If you're not used to being touched, don't go to Japan. Ecological perspective has three uh, components, uh, person, environment, uh, fit. Person environment fit refers to how well a person's needs, goals, and rights mesh with the social and physical environment. Uh, if we watch enough television, then we see that uh, sometimes uh, women from the city are married, ma married farmers, and then they go out to the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they can't handle it because, wow, there's no, there's no new clothes, and there's no, they have to cook every day, and there's no fast food restaurants. I know how the world <laughs> had to park their own damn car. This isn't fair. I have nieces uh, from Chicago that uh, can drive. They can drive, but they can't cook. And the reason they can't cook is because in Chicago, you don't have to cook. The food is so bad in Chicago. I mean, it's so bad. I can't believe the people are eating that. Food. I mean, it's bad. They call deep dish pizza from Chicago. You know why they did that? Somebody made a mistake and put the wrong, I don't know, the wrong thing in there. And so now all of a sudden they got cake and then so they put all this crappy stuff on top of it and then they call it deep dish pizza from Chicago. It's nasty. Or their hot wings is pretty nasty too. I don't eat hot wings. You know, when I was growing up, uh, <coughs> part of the chicken that you fed to the cat with the wings because there's no meat on them. <laughs> you just throw them outside. The cat would eat the meat off of them and the dogs would eat the bones. As in the old days, now it's even Christmas, everybody's cooking wings. There's no meat on those things. Sometimes there's no skin on those things. Anyway, okay, so sometimes the, the pe people don't fit their environment. Adaptations are the processes uh, people use to sustain or increase the level uh, a fit between themselves and the environment. You do whatever you can. When I was in Japan, I ran a lot. And the reason I ran was because I couldn't stand 
the environment. The, I was having a hard time with the environment. So I figured I'd just exercise, and that would dissipate my needs. And for the most part, it worked. Uh, the earthquakes were kind of hard to get used to. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for something to fall down, but nothing ever fell down. Um, for some reason, they built these high rises, so they're like four stories high. And uh, when they had an earthquake, it would, they were on rollers, so it would roll back and forth. But it would fling everything out of the, out of the uh, cabinets and whatnot. I know, it's kind of stupid. We were on the bottom floor. We, we had a, an apartment on the bottom floor. So we just kind of rolled from the side to the side. They put everything on the roller. Kind of hard, but we adapted. The cats didn't adapt, though. They had a really hard time with it. You know. The cats had a really hard time with it. As soon as uh, the uh, earthquake would start, they would uh, they would run away. Oh, come on. What have I done? Did I touch something? It's okay. Adaptations. Anyway, the cats had a hard time with that. Life stressors are issues that exceed the resources of an individual to deal with them. And of course, that has to do with uh, not being able to handle the noise. Uh, when we were living in Northridge, California, uh, there, you can't live out in Northridge because Northridge used to be out. You know, Hollywood's here and Anaheim. And, you know, it's, it's just, you just keep going out farther and farther out. Well, Northridge is like the second farthest out. So it's real built up, but uh, we had this major high, this major road going right past us. Uh, and I didn't realize what was going on, but uh, noise all night long. I mean, there were cars all night long and motorcycles. Uh, evidently, people that ride motorcycles think that uh, they have to rev them up in order to go from one place to another. <laughs> so there's a lot of noise. I mean, just tons and tons of noise. And this is... Uh, there were trees on both sides of the, the street, so when the motorcycles went down the, the street, it would echo inside that <coughs> tunnel. It was like a tunnel of trees. I was horrible. And of course, does anybody ride motorcycles? They are so loud. They are so ridiculously loud. And the louder they are, the, the more they, the more impressed they are with themselves. So I, I don't know. I haven't figured that one out yet. Anyway, all night long. I mean, it was just terrible. All these cars going back and forth. And of course, I'm a ruralist. I'm used to being out in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, so that was a stressor. And we didn't realize it. We were there for a year and a half, but we were sleep deprived. And we didn't realize it until we went, we visited, we visited somebody and it was quiet. And we just slept the whole time we were there because we were so sleep deprived. I mean, you wake up at, you know, you've got somebody that, and it, uh, a, a motorcycle, it doesn't really sound like a gun, but it's very loud and it's, it's very sharp. So every time one of those things went off, I was waking up and not realizing what was going on. This, you know, you gotta save the world from <coughs> shooting some of those. Uh, in the ecological perspective, <coughs> behaviors are not seen as dysfunctional or maladaptive. It's just you trying to get along with the environment, or them trying to get along with the environment. Instead, behavior is viewed as adaptations to improve the fit between the individual and, and the environment. A lot of times they'll do something that is relatively negative. Uh, maybe an individual will start an affair because they don't like where they have moved. Uh, we saw this a lot in the military. Individuals, uh, well, we saw it a lot with uh, city people that came to, the, to rural areas. Like I said, the Air Force is mostly out. Uh, and for that reason, uh, and they're, mo they're usually not very close to, to big cities because the, uh, uh, the real estate in those areas are too expensive. Uh, so usually it's in a, around a small town. A lot of these individuals coming from the cities, they didn't like it. Uh, they couldn't handle it. They, wanted, they needed excitement. They needed fast food. They needed good food. They needed wine, women, and song or something. Anyway, they, uh, so they'd start an affair. And one of the reasons they would start an affair is because they were trying to break out of this, this new mold that they were in. And it was just them trying to adapt to the environment that they were in. They were, and a lot of times they would get divorces and then move back to the big city. 
because they uh, had, uh, had been adulterous. It really kind of screwed. Now, would that be the same as when they returned home as well? Like soldiers when they returned home for that same behavior to happen again? Well, it wasn't the soldiers that were doing it, it was the spouses that were doing it. The soldiers were, I mean, they had tons of stuff to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were kept busy. I mean, they were on duty 24-7. Mm -hmm. It was the spouses that had problems. And it, in this case, it was usually the females. And they would have, uh, it was always, almost always females. Because not very many female military personnel at this time. This is back in the 70s. Uh, so that we saw that just at time. Mm -hmm. uh, and not only that, but they would come in, and they, if you were nice to them, they would start flirting with you and going, wait a minute, <laughs> you're, you're, mar <laughs> you're married to the major, right? <laughs> and I've only got two stripes, you're going to get me shot, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But it, it, it happened all over the place, it was really kind of a mess. But they were trying to adapt to their environment, and it was very difficult for them. A lot of these individuals were, uh, of course, the, the, it was a pilot training base, so you had, you had the stud pilots and then they married uh, trophy wives. And drove their uh, drove their corvettes, and so the trophy wives are ex cheerleaders, and they're used to being flirted with. And it just got it, it was pretty messy, pretty ugly. But they were just trying to adapt to their environment. They weren't used to that type of an environment. Uh, so that's the ecological perspective. The strengths perspective uh, views all the people as having strengths. We all have our own strengths. We all have our own weaknesses, but we're not going to focus on the weaknesses. We're just going to focus on the strengths. Uh, this is, this, this is uh, the, the way that, that uh, uh, social workers work. Uh, they, somebody comes in and, and, uh, and, and they, they see all these deficits, but that's not what they focus on. They focus on, well, you have the ability to stop doing this, uh, you have a lot of strength, you're a very intelligent person. They try to focus on their strengths. And by focusing on their strengths, they build up their strengths. They get them to, to start focusing on their strengths themselves. One of the problems that uh, individuals will have is that they lose sight of their own ability to, to handle the situation. Uh, so by focusing on the strengths, what we are doing is we are uh, reminding them that instead of <coughs> focusing on the negative, they need to focus on the positive. Does that make sense? And it works. It really works. People feel, that's, this is one of the reasons why people feel so good coming out of counseling, because uh. instead of saying, well, you know, you're depressed and uh, you're doing all these negative things, uh, all, what you're trying to tell them is you've got this strength and you have the ability to uh, uh, survive from this because you have these strengths. I think I told you about my own research. Instead of focusing all the, on all the negatives that, that you could focus on dealing with American Indians, I wanted to fo focus on positives. And of course, they didn't like that because they didn't <coughs> use funding from the federal government. <laughs> oh man, I, I just don't understand. I, I get into so much stupid trouble because I'm so, so negative sometimes. I'm so positive sometimes. I'm just too positive. Come on. There we go. Come on, come on. There we go. Uh, it uh, focuses on assets clients have developed throughout their lives, of course. And I'm going to touch it again. The strength is defined as, as any psychological process that enables a person to think and act in order to benefit himself or herself and uh, and society. So these, this is what we, we need to focus on. Strengths are often developed when people struggle with difficulties, traumas, oppression, disappointments, and adversity. They have survived up to this point. So there is something that has allowed them to do that. A lot of times people do not recognize their own strength. They think they get strength from other individuals. Well, it was my dad that helped me out. Your dad may have helped you out, but you're the one that, that uh, was able to survive. Well, your dad didn't make it possible for you to survive. He just gave you the stuff. Swear, what a day I'm having. Everyone has <laughs> the capacity to develop new resources, to make positive changes, and to use his or her com uh, competencies to solve problems. We all have th this capability. You have the capability of making a decision. 
and it's your decision that, uh, that, that is going to move you forward. <coughs> I love that picture. Just with you lady, she's got a big, 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 big arm. <laughs> so we all have strengths. Strength perspective invites clients to discover, think about, and figure out how to use their strengths. This is different from the traditional counseling because they tend to identify deficits, weaknesses, and problems. So rather than focusing on the negative, we focus on the positive, especially social workers. They focus on the positive, and this helps, this will help the clients. This will definitely help the clients, or it can help the clients. <coughs> when working with individuals, families, groups, or organizations, a uh, practitioner looks for their strengths, identifies their resources, and invites them to focus on possibilities for the future. In other words, think uh, progressively. Uh, think about your strengths. Yes, you're going to survive. The first thing that you need to convince yourself of is that you are going to make it. So we need to start thinking for the future. Uh, so if I were dealing with a classroom full of individuals, which I kind of am, I would probably tell you, well, what are you going to do after you graduate? Let's start, from, let's start there. So here you are, your sophomores or juniors, uh, you're struggling, it's, it's a tough semester, you've got lots and lots to do. Uh, but rather than focus on uh, whatever, ne whatever negative thing is happening to you right now, let's focus on well, where you're going to go when you graduate. <coughs> so we're, we're making the assumption that you will graduate and that you will make it. Uh, maybe that's it. Right. Right. That you will make it. And because of that, of course, we start, you start seeing your, your strengths. So instead of, instead of working from this point and, and seeing no light at the end of the tunnel, we're going to start at the end of the tunnel and we're going to look back. <coughs> yeah, so we're going to follow the light into the tunnel instead of, instead of looking out and seeing just a pinpoint of light. How is this, um, in, how is counseling different than, well, I know how it's different in chemical dependency counseling, but right. like, a lot of the techniques you use is still kind of the same. Try, try to identify their strengths. Um, it, it is different. Uh, if we're talking about chemical dependency, uh, a lot of times they use they will uh, use their weaknesses as excuses for, for doing drugs. So that's why you focus on their strengths. And don't try not to talk about their weaknesses. If you talk about their weaknesses, then, then uh, you know, they're just looking for an excuse. Mm -hmm. they're, they're the best. They are really good. They're liars, too. Oh, my God. They're such good liars. They're just looking for an excuse. Or they're, they're trying to pick a fight so that the only way they can get over this fight is to go on use again. So you, know, you you got to focus on your strengths, and you got have to be continually positive as far as they're concerned. But you have to be strong in that you can't let them. And you can't ever tell them that you can use them. you can pro you'll you'll be able to use it again in the future. Don't do that. Don't tell them. Well, you know, as soon as we fix you, then you can you can go out and have a social drink. Don't ever tell them that because. That's what they'll focus on. And the first thing that will happen after you clean them up is they'll go out and they'll have a drink and they will get drunk again. Or they'll use again. Or they'll, they'll stay, they'll go on a binge is what they'll do. So you have to be really careful. And this is what happened to Robin Williams. Robin, William, Robin Williams was having problems. And so he went back to rehab. Not He wasn't using, but he went back to rehab. And he found out that he had um, Alzheimer's disease, but it was uh, fast uh, progressing yeah. Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so when he went back to rehab, they didn't treat him right. They treated him like he was a celebrity. And when he got out, he went on a bench. He went on a bench, and then he committed suicide. 
Whoops. You can't do that. You can't ever let them go back. Or at least do the best job that you can. They're always looking for an excuse. Uh, a drunk uh, has to wake up every day and tell themselves that they're not going to drink anymore. And they will if they, if, they, if they don't maintain their strength. And I, I've known people that uh, had been alcoholics 17 years before, and every morning they had to wake up and, and tell themselves, I am strong enough that I'm not going to drink today. For years, every day, for years, then they told themselves that every day. Um, when I was up north, north, there was a holy man that, uh, that uh, he, every morning he would wake up and he would, uh, he'd been to rehabilitation. They had tried to rehab him dozens and dozens of times and nothing ever took. Then he went up on the mountain and he, he had a, uh, it wasn't a vision quest, but he had, he went, uh, he fasted up on a mountain. And as soon as he came down, he was, he was, he was cured to the extent that now he knew that he was there to help his people. And every morning he told himself, I'm not only here to keep myself sober, but I'm here to help my people. And that's what, that's what gave him the, the strength to keep from drinking. And he'd been an alcoholic for decades. And he just stopped one day. So you, that, that's what you have to do. Am I, am I helping? Good old son. He died of Alzheimer's disease, by the way. Interesting guy. Uh, he'd go into a sweat and, uh, and he would start singing, and he was okay. Uh, and he would sing through the whole thing and have no problems whatsoever. But one time he took his teeth in. So <laughs> he tried to sing with his teeth. He, would, he didn't have any teeth. He had false teeth. And so while he was singing, they'd pop out. <laughs> and they'd pop into the water. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> oh, that was funny. I was there when it happened. Resilience uh, perspective is the ability to survive and thrive in the face of overwhelming life challenges. Lots of stuff happens to people. What happened this weekend? Did we have we had thunderstorms uh, all over the Midwest. Uh, they had uh, monstrous thunderstorms. They had monstrous thun thunderstorms last week, like Tuesday or Thursday. Uh, trees were crashing down onto people's houses. It was really pretty bad. Um, and there are hurricanes, there's tornadoes. Uh, I don't know if you remember, Maria hit last year uh, and devastated the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, of course, FEMA was supposed to go in and clean things up and they didn't help very much. Uh, there, were, there are still people without electricity on the island. Uh, at first they said there were only 12 people died. Over 4,000 people died on the island as that's concerned. So how in the world did the rest of the people survive? Well, the reason they survived is because they adapted to the situation and that's why they survived. They had resilience. Resilience is a dynamic process that is the outcome of positive adaptation in the face of adversity, stress, or risk. I mean, they could have just gone screaming through the, uh, through the streets going, I can't handle this, I can't handle this. Like, what, what good would that have done anybody? So they had to be resilient and survive. And if they were looking for help from the United States government, they weren't getting it at all. Oh, it was terrible. But eventually, of course, uh, they, they adapted and, and things got fixed, not by FEMA, not by the federal government, but usually by the local government. And that's how they were able to survive. Resilience is not a, a fixed personality trait or an inborn characteristic. Uh, no one is either vulnerable or resilient all the time. Sometimes people can be resilient in one, uh, in one aspect of life and not resilient in another aspect of life. Uh, I was a pretty tough dude until I got a divorce. And that was, that was really hard for me. That was really, really hard. Uh, I started out, my running weight was 145, and I went down to 117 pounds. Uh, not because I wasn't eating, but because it wasn't sticking, it wasn't sticking when I did eat. Uh, and I guess I probably wasn't eating as much as I thought I was. And I had, I had two kids to take care of. Uh, so it was tough. It was really hard. So I was fairly resilient in all other aspects of whatever the hell was going on. But that was a tough one for me. That was really, really hard. And probably the hardest part was uh, feeling that society would see me differently. 
that was the hardest part for me. Uh, thinking that here I had failed, I had failed. And I failed before, but never socially. So that was a tough one. Resilience is learned behaviors and patterns of adaptation. We learn these things. So the second time I got a divorce, it wasn't nearly as bad. I only went down to 119 pounds the second, after the second divorce. Of course, I had only been married to her for about five months. Resilience depends on the availability of protective factors, and of course, you need protective factors. The toughest part was that I was in Lubbock, Texas, and my whole family was up in Indiana. So I had no body. I had no body to help take care of the kids. The uh, military will tell you if you uh, if you have children, they didn't they didn't issue you your children, so you have to take care of them yourself. They didn't issue you a wife, so if you're having problems with your wife, you're gonna have to do something yourself. That, that helped a lot. <laughs> just made me think of, um, was it, that one, major pain, where she asked him, why aren't you married yet? You know, he sounded like, well, I figured if the Marines wanted me to have a wife, they'd they would have you issued you what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is true, unfortunately. <clears throat> But luckily, they had, uh, there was a little financial help. Uh, because if you remember, I told you my wife stabbed me because she had just mm -hmm. emptied my checking account. Well, she took off right after that. And I had no money. I mean, I was broke. Uh, not only that, but I needed to put the kids in, in daycare. And I didn't have any money to put them in daycare. So they, uh, they waived the first month. Uh, they, uh, and they, they gave me $200, which was kind of nice. Pretty nice. <clears throat> Risk factors or any influence factors, so I did, there were, I was getting support. I was getting support from the United States military. I mean, otherwise, I, what would they have done? They would have had to have kicked me out of the service. It didn't make a whole lot of sense at that point. They just trained me for several million dollars. But if it was the other way around, they would have punished you, right? All right. Oh, sure, if they found out what, that she stabbed me three times that day. No, I mean, like, if you were the, the, if she was the victim and you were the Oh yeah, victim, yeah. If I if yeah, if I had beaten her up and, Yeah, they would have punished you, right? Yeah, they would have punished me. They'd take the stripes away. Which makes a lot of sense. They would have taken money away from me. <laughs> they would have court martialed me. Yeah, all kinds of horrible things could potentially have happened. Risk factors are any influencing factors that can bring or predict negative outcomes on the functioning and overall development of the individual. Uh, they can include biological influences, individual influences, family influences, and com community influences. Uh, one, well, like I said, the, the thing that hurt me the most was, was the social factor of losing my, of losing my wife. Um, when I was growing up, <clears throat> when I was growing up, uh, we weren't religious, and everybody else was. I lived in a Methodist, in a Methodist area. Uh, so we were we were rejected. We were rejected people because we didn't go to church, and that was pretty tough. Uh, it was kind of hard for them to ignore us because we were all the smartest people in each of our classes, except me. I was like 18 or something. But uh, my, all my brothers and sisters were all the smartest kids in my class. It's kind of hard to ignore the smart kids, <clears throat> and I kind of rode on their coattails. I was kind of lazy. But uh, community influences were huge. Uh, so they left us off list because we didn't go to church. We couldn't join the Boy Scouts. We couldn't, you know, everybody was in D-Malay. We couldn't join D-Malay because, you know, it's a Methodist organization. You know, it's really kind of Job's daughters, you know, all the, the rest of the mess. <clears throat> anyway, so we were rejected people. So when I lost my wife, or when my wife left, I mean, it was really tough because, you know, it was... Society was telling me, <laughs> first of all, I, we got married in a church. We got married in a Methodist church. She was a Methodist. She was a good Methodist. And now all of a sudden she was gone. So That which made me socially acceptable, now I, I wasn't part of that, uh, that group anymore. So it's really kind of, kind of tough. Protective factors are any factors that can exert either direct or indirect influences to buffer the negative effects of, of risk factors. Protective factors include your strengths, your capabilities, your talents, your coping skills, uh, your resources, and your assets. Uh, well, maybe I was rejected by society, but at least I can change a diaper. 
That's, that's one of my <laughs> coping skills. Uh, maybe, maybe I couldn't, uh, maybe society didn't like me anymore, but at least I could cook and my children wouldn't starve. I didn't have enough money to take them out. Uh, but, uh, but at least we didn't starve. And I bought the milk. We drank a lot of milk. Anyway, so all these things, you know, we can accumulate all these things throughout our lives. Uh, I can sew, I can wash clothes, I can wash dishes, I can do all these things that some, some guys can't do or won't do for one reason or, or another. I don't know how the washing machine works. Oh, you just turn the damn thing off. Yeah, like it's a man's invention. Exactly. It should be intuitive for you. You can change a carburetor, but you can't work the washing machine. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. A washing machine is two buttons and it's done. I know, I know. I have no problems with it at all. Uh, resilience or loading the wash off the dishwasher? How hard is that? Loading the dishwasher? Oh, that's heavy labor. Uh, resilience represents uh, both a process and the outcome of competent functioning. Resilience is an outcome in, uh, involves the interplay of risk and protective factors. Uh, resilience as an outcome uh, represents the results of positive functioning and competence developed when facing adversity. <laughs> and of course, as we face adversity, we try to survive. We hope to survive. And uh, this is what we, this is what, how we come out of it, uh, by, uh, by doing positive things, by adapting to our environment. We have to adapt to our environment. And that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to adapt to my environment. Uh, when I when I first picked up my dogs, of course, my, both of my dogs are strays. Uh, I was having problems keeping them in the backyard, so I built a fence it's about this high. First, then they started jumping over the fence. Now, then I built one that was this high. Then they started digging under the fence, and I I needed to adapt in order to keep my dogs in the backyard. But now I've got a big dog that comes around and, try, and jumps over my fence and tries to get my dogs to go out. I'm about to shoot that dog. God, I'm not going to shoot the dog. Do your, do your red dogs, are they pretty now? Uh, the one of them is. The other one's just as ugly as she ever was. But, uh, <laughs> okay. One of them's half Sharpe and half uh, Yellow Lab. Oh, yeah, he's, oh, wow. yeah, he's kind of cute. He's, he's okay. The other one's part pit bull and, I don't know, something else. And somebody clipped their ears, so she's got no ears. And then they clipped her tail and they clipped half of her tail. They were using her for fighting. I'm sorry? Were they using her for fighting? I don't know. She was, she had puppies when she first arrived. She, she had nubs when she first arrived. So I don't know she had The first time I picked her up, she squirted the milk over. I don't know. So she, yeah. But somebody had taken her out and she was starving to death. I don't know where she came from. They probably took her, her puppies and then they took her out to the woods and tied her up. She had a rope around her neck that she chewed through. So, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know what happened. Anyway, she's the one that keeps digging under the fence. <laughs> so, and she's too ugly. Bring her to my house. She's pretty ugly. <coughs> but she's a protector. She's a protector. Another dog came around uh, my grandson um, and uh, started jumping on my grandson. And she she took him down and uh, she's going to kill him. Not my grandson, but the other dog. <laughs> yeah, they're very, they're very good family dogs. Uh, I don't know about that. As long as he doesn't make any kind of a funny noise, I guess he will do. Practitioners using the resilience perspective uh, start with an assessment of the relevant factors and then focus on helping clients build on, uh, on the resilience that they have developed. So but we were, once again, we're, we're looking for their strengths. We're trying to identify the fact that they have survived in a, a negative environment. So we're trying to identify the fact that they are resilient. Sometimes just knowing that you're resilient can be enough. This is what I was trying to do in up in Montana. Uh, they were having a spate of uh, suicides in the junior high school and the high school. And so I thought if we can prove, if we can show resilience, then potentially that will convince the kids that, that they have the strength to survive. 
Um, uh, sometimes suicide is just a, uh, a momentary act of weakness, a momentary act of I give up, of being overwhelmed. And if we could, if, I thought if we could convince them that they are resilient, that uh, it might change things. So it was, uh, it was an attempt to uh, combat the, uh, the spate of suicides that we've had. We didn't have any suicides in the, in the, at the college, we had suicides uh, in the junior high and, and the high school. So it didn't have anything to do with me, it had to do with the tribe. So I, they agreed that, that this sounded like a good idea, and then when it came to funding, of course, I didn't need any funding, but they needed funding for suicide prevention. And if, yeah, if I if this if, if if I had finished my research, then, so then they wouldn't have gotten as much get funding. Your dissertation, or you did get your dissertation? I did. I finished my dissertation, but I, I had to do it. I had to cheat a little. Well, Cheating is not the right word. What I had to do was I couldn't get the tribe to agree to allow me to do the research on the reservation. So you have to do your research. No, what I did was I did it off the reservation. See, by the, I'd been there for 10 years, so I knew all the families, and I knew all the names of all the people that were, were native. So I just got a, a list of all the people in the county, uh, and the ones with, with the names that were, were Indian names, I, I sent them a, a survey. So I did it off the reservation. The, 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 the uh, tribe had no control over the people off the reservation. They only had control of the people on the reservation. That was my point of view, right? Well, they didn't agree. <laughs> and I lost my job. Because they told me not to do it, and I did it anyway. But I mean, such a rebel, Bruce. I know. <clears throat> but I was trying to help. I didn't want those kids to commit suicide anymore. It was, well, we were going to the rescue. The kids at the school rebelled. It was a mess. It was a huge mess. The person that fired me, every time she started to speak to the students, the students would start yelling at her. <laughs> they had to fire the lady that fired me. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with it. I was... I didn't have anything to do with it. <clears throat> they did it on their own. Practitioners focus on helping clients uh, develop a positive outlook on life and self-confidence, maintain, promote, and enhance protective factors, Recall successful events in their lives, identify resources, view a mistake as a window of learning, uh, focus on the present and the future, and of course, this is how you build resilience. You, you focus on these things. Well, you made this mistake. What did you learn from that? That's, that's what you do if they, if they uh, made a mistake. What if they just keep, like I have a cousin who, um, She's like the same age as my daughter, but I have a cousin who just like keeps going back to math, 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 you know, and she comes home and she's like, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, and so everybody tries to no, focus she's not. on her, yeah, they try to focus on her present and the future and putting her in treatment, put her in Rocky Mountain Center treatment, Great Falls. And you know, so on and so on and so on. She's been in like six rehabs, and she's got a daughter. And she just, when I went home, she was standing on the street, you know, and she's like, you know, <laughs> she was tongue flapping in the wind. Somebody <laughs> needs to tell her. Well, what did you learn from the? I mean, now that you're sorry, what did you learn from the last time? Why? Why? What made you go back to meth? What was the trigger that made you go back? That's what they mean. People are <coughs> pretending that the past never happened. And all that's going to happen is she's going to do exactly the same thing. Because she's, she needs to build on the, the, the fact that she's failed. She needs to focus on what made her fail. So you need to ask her, what, what triggered you to do this again? What triggered you to, to have a relapse? Nobody's doing that. Because nobody wants to hurt her feelings. They don't. Yeah. I know. They're like let's, walking let's... on eggshells. Like, <coughs> that. She'll, like climb out this rock because she has a daughter. And she goes home and she just steals everything. And then she's gone. 
but this she posted a picture and in her face she could tell something happened to her that made her come back home and sober up a little bit. Something bad really happened, like like you could almost really see the guilt and the, the shame and everything in her, you know. Forgetting that bad things happen isn't going to work. You need to understand why those bad things happen and how those bad things happen so that they don't happen again. Pretending that they didn't occur just means that it's more likely to occur again. So you need to go back and you need to tell her or you need to ask her, why did you do this? What was it that made you do this again? What was the trigger? I mean, until people, and people won't want you to do it. Oh, no, no, you'll hurt the feelings. She won't come back next time. No, maybe she won't do it again. We need to make her think <clears throat> about the past. Question. And, and correct the past. Um, someone that I know who has somebody else is an avid mask user for many years. And according to this person, just the smell of meth, whether it's on somebody's clothes sure. or whatever, is right. a major trigger. Oh, you bet. Of course. And this person is not only diabetic, but also now on dialysis. They're dead. I'm sorry. I didn't and, mean to say uh, that. <laughs> they're on dialysis. They're, they're on crystal meth. Yep. They're on the Ds. Yeah, they're on the Ds, all right. <laughs> But the thing is, the attitude is what gets to me. Is it doesn't really matter because when I go to dialysis, it's all washed out anyway. Yeah. Like I'm clean and clear, you know. No, they're not. But the attitude is just totally negative I, to me. The doctor has never told them that they can't keep doing this because. Of course it's, they have. Okay. I'm sure. Well. We're not going to last for very long. I apologize for that. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Life is life. It's, it, it's, there's, there's always a trigger. It, it may be, it's probably a smell. It's probably, maybe it's a, a friend that's a drinker that makes them want to go out and get drunk. Every time I'm around the gym, the uh, gym uh, uh, makes me want to go out and drink. So what do I do when I come home? I try to find Jim, of course, because then I get drunk and now I get, you know, Jim's my excuse, he's my critic. Uh, sometimes it's going past a certain bar or it's a select smell. Uh, meth has a very strong smell. Marijuana has a very strong smell. All you have to do is smell it and, and all of a sudden you, you, you crave it? Of course, of course you do. So you, what do you need to do? Well, you need to change your lifestyle. You need to never go around Jim anymore. Jim's toxic. You don't drive past that bar because every time you drive past that bar, you want to turn in and just have one, and which turns out to be a, a, a weekend binge, binge drinking bout. Uh, so that's what you have to do. I mean, I wish that I wish it weren't that way. But mm -hmm. people are addicted to select things. They're not only addicted to the drug, but they're also addicted to the trigger. And it's the trigger that makes them do it again. Right, Chris? Does all this make sense? Yes. Okay, stay away from the trigger. So if it's more of like, is it like more of a punishment and reward kind of thing? I mean, like the whole Pablo about, you know, the theory of that where they go for something and they get a rewarding feeling. It becomes sure. a rewarding of feeling getting drunk. Sure. So in order for them to undo that, they have to recondition yeah. themselves with a different trigger, with a different metal, with a different sure. reward. Sure. So I'm going to drive past the church hoping somebody's getting married. Because <laughs> I hear that bell, well, I'm going to pull right into the bar. <laughs> it's time to drink, man. I heard the bell. Did you hear the bell? I heard the bell. <laughs> The empowerment perspective describes a process by which individuals, groups, or communities uh, take control of their circumstances to achieve their goals. Empowerment has an internal as well as an external component to it. Empowerment, we need to empower people to fix themselves. The internal component of empowerment is called psychological empowerment. Uh, controlling, uh, we control our motivations, our cognitions, and our personality. Our personality changes, our motivations change, and of course, 
our thoughts change. Internal empowerment involves a belief that the individual will make uh, competent decisions, solve their problems, achieve their goals, and have a significant impact on the environment. Some people don't think they have the strength. Some people don't think that they have the right to do this. They want to ask grandma. They want to ask. They want somebody else to fix them. But we need to empower them to be able to do this themselves because grandma's not only, always going to be around. And when she's gone, what happens next? Well, all of a sudden, you can't fix yourself anymore because you can't go talk to grandma. <clears throat> so what we have to do is we have to convince them that they can do it themselves. The external component of empowerment includes the tangible knowledge, competencies, skills, uh, information, opportunities, and resources that allow the person to take action and actively advocate change. So that's the environment. The external aspect is the environment. The internal aspect is your own mindset. Empowerment, like resilience, is a process as well as an outcome. Uh, new competencies learned from experience uh, leads to new feelings of empowerment. Research shows that the more involved an individual, the stronger the feeling of empowerment. The more involved the individual is. Okay. <laughs> How much more do I have to go? Okay. Uh, the, the empowerment perspective allows clients to develop a sense of power and competency as they experience using their skills and knowledge in new and challenging ways. And of course, that has to do with empowerment. So empowerment and strength and resilience, all of these things may sound alike, but the reality is, of course, they, and they are, there, there is a, 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 an aspect that is the, is the same. We are seeking strengths. Uh, we're trying to make you fix yourselves. Uh, the only way to actually fix somebody is to fix, allow them to fix themselves. And that's uh, the bottom line. And, and the more you let people fix themselves, the, the longer they're going to stay fixed. And that's the way it is. I have to stop right here.